I'd like to introduce Jordan Wines. Is it Wines? Yeah. You'd think after this long I'd know how to pronounce your name. Uh, who's going to be talking about uh, corrupting the youth uh, without porn? <laughs> so if you were here for that reason, I'm sorry to disappoint. 20-second biography. I'm Cyphertext Jordan Wines. I'm a hacker, occasionally a teacher, a CTF champion, though usually I'm a CTF loser. I'm a CTF organizer. Go play Ghost in the Shell Code right now if you haven't already checked it out. It's a great CTF. I'm a presenter. I am a family man. I'm a nerf addict. I can quit any time. And occasionally I do real work. So, the talk in 30 seconds. A few months ago, I went about corrupting some children. Of course, I told their parents it was a creative problem solving class, but really I was teaching them hacking. We covered topics like hacking culture, ethics, lock picking, office munitions, magic tricks, Social engineering, number systems. Thanks for coming. <laughs> All right, no, no. Bruce would not be happy with me. Uh, there's three things this talk is actually going to do. First, I would like to encourage people here to be doing this. I think that this is a, a very good thing, a fun thing. There's a lot of value in it. And if I, do, if I can get just one or two people who have n not done something like this to do something like this before, then success. I'd like to enable you, I'd like to help you by giving you some resources, by pointing out the things that I did so you can rip me off. Uh, it's Creative Commons licensed for that exact purpose. And then I'd like to warn you about some of the pitfalls, some of the problems, some of the things that, uh, that were issues that I kind of had to deal with. All right, encouragement. First, why would we do such a thing? Um, you know, because I got a lot of other spare hobbies that I could use to get away with, so it's not like my free time is that valuable. I do have, I have two kids and a wife, so that is a priority, but everybody needs a little bit of downtime and something else fun to do, and I could be playing StarCraft or Angry Birds, or it could be, you know, actually impacting the community, so I think that th that's uh, uh, a, a pretty good justification. Uh, it, it is still a lot of work, though, because, you know, who wants to go babysit a bunch of fifth graders or kids of, of any age, uh, even the adult ones? Uh, but th there's, there's three really good reasons, I think, to justify this. So the first one, critical thinking. Uh, we as an InfraSec community, we as a geek community, value critical thinking skills very highly. And that may not always be the case for the rest of the public. Uh, a friend actually told me about a bumper sticker he has that uh, says critical thinking, the other national deficit. Uh, I, I think that's a, that's a great summary. So. The, the, the point of this class to me was, let's teach some critical thinking skills. This is, this, these are one of those lessons in school that as you're teaching, uh, yeah, you're going to learn math and trigonometry, but who remembers that nowadays? And who remembers like problem solving and getting along? All these other things that we learn in school that are actually more important to getting along in life. I think teaching critical thinking is vastly, vastly important. It's what prevents things like SOPA and PIPA from being written up. Um, when you have critical thinking skills, you can, you can kind of evade this. Secondly, hacker rehab, and I don't actually mean rehabilitating hackers, I mean rehabilitating the term hacker, right? The public thinks one thing when they hear the word hacker, and it's not the thing that we in the room would want people to think when they hear the term hacker. Hacker means something good, it means something productive, it means a lot of valuable skills, and that's what I wanted to kind of teach. I wanted to get people uh, in the general public. Uh, one of the really cool things, is there's, there is a trend in our community right now, I think as, as much of information, as the InfoSec community kind of grows up, and a lot of the, uh, there's, there's a lot of families and a lot of, uh, a, a greater diversity, I think, in a lot of ways, uh, of ages. It's not just a bunch of uh, teens and young 20s kind of playing around and, and breaking stuff, but we have much more diversity, which is really exciting. And we've got more families, we've got more kids, we have DEF CON kids now even this year. So we're reaching out and we're developing programs, we're realizing that we do need to sort of be bringing up the next generation of hackers. But for the most part, we've been focused on our own kids in a lot of ways. And so part of my focus was sort of to reach out to the muggles of the world and to get kids that have no background. So every kid that, that, that was in this, this class didn't have anybody who was a, like a hardcore geek in the family. They didn't already know how to program and were really all kind of aware of all these concepts. This was all new to them and fun. So that made it both more of a challenge, um, but I think ultimately more valuable because, again, if everybody goes out and does this, now we've got this public perception of, of both the skills and of what we do and why it's valuable and as well as a, a proper understanding of, of who we are. The third reason I think it's really important to do something like this is to give back. I think that everybody in this room has had people mentor them, they've had good examples, they've had people that have helped them along the way, and so I think we just, as a uh, humanity, have an obligation to, to turn around and do likewise. This is, this is our, uh, the neighborly thing to do. And so, 
to me, doing this in a community is the way to do it. I, I think that there's a lot of other ways you can impact the world that are great, but when you're impacting your local community, there's a lot of direct benefit of that, and so going and finding a, a, a local community to help is, is, is to me, just a, a, a good way to do that, a good way to, to work off that, that karmic balance a little bit. So this is the other reason you do it. You do it for the kids, right? I gotta have a do it for the kids slide in here, because uh, again, I think the, the concepts of what I'm talking about applies to just about any age of class you're gonna do. There are some things that were specific to the, the fifth and sixth graders that I was teaching, uh, but it's a lot of fun too that I've got you know this whole class of kids that I'd never met before, and uh, it, they're a lot of fun. I like all of them except for the guy you can't see. There's one kid to the right. He was a real troublemaker. Um, I still like him, but he was a troublemaker. Uh, so it, it's just a lot of fun, right? And so to have the kids run up to you now and really excited every time they see me, just because I think they're going to do something fun, and uh, you know I've, I've fooled them all into thinking I'm that exciting. Um, I think that's that's really cool. So. And you can tell, I mean, look how much fun they're having. Look at that kid in the front row. Isn't he having a blast? You can see his, the white shirt. He is just really thrilled to be doing that. All right. So the other reason we should be doing this is because there's actually a lot of opportunities. So if, if you're thinking that, well, how would I do it? Where do I go? Well, again, I'm going to give you some practical topics to do, some suggestions. But then also, there's already a lot of opportunities. One of the ones I meant to add in here as well that I didn't get into was, was even like, you know, the Boy Scouts. There's a lot of organizations that if you've got something to share, if you've got skills and knowledge and ability, they would love to have you come out and to, to talk, talk about it. You can be as involved or as uninvolved as you want. You could do a kind of a one-off fire and forget. You could set up a whole program. Uh, there's the After School Alliance. Call a local school. Find out what the people in your community and your neighborhood are doing. There's a lot of community center uh, that do these things, YMCA's, library systems often have public speaking topics. They may already have a, a, a summer camp for kids, things you can be involved in. Uh, I, the one that I did was a church that was putting on an after school program that, was, that I was involved in. But there's, just, there's really a lot of opportunities and there's a lot of need. There's a lot of the stuff going on. Uh, and it, to me, it, it was a blast to do it. So enabling, actually encouraging you to do it. Um, I'm mostly just going to be giving out lesson plans, but I'm not a very good teacher, so they're not particularly well formatted. They are going to be uploaded to a website, and I'm going to be putting slides and all the resources and links and, and pointing you to, to all the different topics that, that I think were useful. Um, but the important thing that I want, to, I want to mention is these are the lesson plans that, that I thought were fun. These are the things that I wanted to do because I'm passionate about or I'm interested in. You should be teaching what you're passionate about and what you're interested in. And if you want to cheat and have a backup plan or steal, you're more than welcome. That's why that I'm, I'm giving this out there. Please do. But when you're passionate about the topics that you're presenting on, that's when you're, the kid, you're going to get engaged with the kids. That's when, they're, when they see you're excited, that's when they're going to get excited. And they're going to, they're going to really catch on to that. So you know, don't do something you're like, well, I don't really like this, but I feel like I should cover this topic, so I'm just going to do it. Like, you know, do something you like, whatever it is. And it doesn't even have to be productive, as you'll see with, with some of these. Right. So the first lesson, week one, was actually a, a lot of fun. It was kind of more high level. It was less hands-on, but I think it was really important to the overall tone of the class. It had a lot of good uh, components to it. It was just an introduction to uh, cultures, concepts, ethics, legality of hacking, cracking, freaking, just anything sort of in, in our culture and our history. Uh, there were sort of two phases to it. There was the general problem solving, the creative, the talking about hacking as, as, a, as a concept, and, and uh, there was also the ethics portion. And without being a boring stick in the mud, it's really important to do both. And I think especially for, for children that are developing you know, this sort of sense of, of civics and responsibility and legality, and it, it really matters a lot. Also, from a legal liability perspective, I want to make sure that I'm teaching them you know, legal things to do, and I'm, and I'm and you're emphasizing that so I don't get parents yelling at me that their child is now breaking into houses because I taught them to, to pick locks. Uh, so and so every, every lesson actually, for the most part, had a component on ethics and legality. It turned out to be actually really interesting to, to sort of talk to them. I was impressed that explaining the difference between what's ethical and what's legal and that you, know, you can say a mean thing and that's not illegal necessarily, although the laws are getting crazier, so who knows? But, but it, it is unethical, right? It's not nice, it's not you know, good, and so we were trying to, to, to talk about the difference and how we were doing some things that were important because they were ethical and some things because they were legal, but we have to care about both of these concepts. Uh, so you're welcome to steal my slides. Again, I'm gonna link to a website that has them all. Please feel free to do them, but make sure that they're your own too. Put your own stories in it. The things, what is it that makes you a hacker, that makes you interested in these topics, right? Personal stories always win. So do that as much as possible. Uh, there's the MIT Hacks Gallery, which you know, showing the pranks and hacks is, is always a great thing because who doesn't love that? Uh, and then again, my sample slides are online. 
lock picking. This was sort of the, 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 the most fun, probably in a lot of ways, and also potentially the, the most troublesome because you're gonna teach a bunch of fifth graders to pick locks. The usual response when I got when I was you know, telling friends were that, yeah, I'm gonna go um, corrupt some children. And the first response is what? And the second response is, oh, that's cool. What topics are you gonna do? And, oh, lock picking, really? You're gonna teach a bunch of fifth graders to pick locks? Yeah, I'm gonna go. Uh, this was, this was uh, a, a lot of fun, actually. Uh, it, this one can be a lot of work to set up. Fortunately, I have a really good friend, and he's here, thankfully, Jay. Uh, helped me teach this one, and by help me, I mean, uh, had all the materials and did all the diagrams and did all the real work. So uh, getting friends that you can, you can cheat from is absolutely allowed in this, in, in this kind of environment. Uh, and so we were really lucky in that he at his office has set up a lot, sort of lockpicking village and he actually has just, I don't know, way too many locks. And is your wife in the room? She's not? No. Okay, good then. Because then, she probably should know about all the locks that he's, he's gone on eBay. He trolls for old locks and pins and picks and... and so he had a lot of locks, a lot of picks. We got a couple other friends to kind of donate their, their pick sets that they had to make sure we had you know, enough for everybody. Uh, a, good, a good tidbit here is, because I'm going to talk about the materials and the budget for all of these, because some of them can get kind of expensive. It depends on what, how much you want to do kind of week to week. Uh, but in, in this case, uh, <clears throat> we made some, or he, he made, again, he made, did all the hard work, made some tension wrenches from wiper blade uh, shims. So you can take the metal out of a wiper blade, chop it up, bend it, and poof, you've got a tension wrench for lock picking. Uh, which, is, which is awesome. Also, uh, it was fun to practice with just a paper clip and a tension wrench too. To, it was something that we hadn't done before, before that point. So the, uh, the materials you can get out there, that can save a lot on cost, on cost right? You can, you can do this kind of stuff. And the other key thing was, I, I, from I think about this lesson onward, I tried to, where possible, give something to students they could take home. So in this case, we had extra, I didn't want to give them picks. But extra tension wrenches, one, were cheap because go to any advanced auto parts store, by the way, that does the free wiper blade replacement, and in their trash can every day are dozens of wiper blades, and so you can get as many tension wrenches as you want for free, assuming you're willing to get your hands a little dirty. So uh, I, I gave them out the tension wrenches, and then I told them, yeah, with a paper clip in this, you could pick a lock, but I'm not going to be the one. To, I'm not going to give you a pick. Your parents might really not like me for that, but a tension wrench will will do for that. Uh, and again, this is another one, starting out with the ethics and the laws of your state. You may not be able to do this talk, depending on your state. Uh, so be very careful and check, check the, the laws of your state, I think. Um, Virginia, for example, possession is legal unless you have possession with intent. But also possession equals intent, which is a legal quirk I don't understand. Um, so I, yeah, anyways. Be careful with, with the laws of your state. Um, diagrams were useful. So Jay had some really good diagrams he practiced and he'd done it up, but you know, you really are a clear cutaway if you've got any of the cutaway locks or a clear acrylic lock. This is really good because the, the whole point of this lesson is to really get them thinking about why do things work the way they work, right? Like, don't just as take things for, for granted. My laptop's sliding. Nice. Um, don't take these for granted. Understand how they work and understand the failure modes, right? This is, this is the mindset we're trying to teach. This is that why it's a hacking class, right? And so this is a, a perfect topic to, to, do it in, to do it in. There's a lot of really good resources. So Skylar Town has an amazing set of not only presentations, he's done at conferences with slides, and he's got really good visuals and diagrams, and he's a, a real honest-to-goodness graphic designer, too, and so you can see it shows in his, in his animations. If anybody's seen his talks, they're, they're amazing. Uh, if not, crib off his stuff. It's excellent. He's got YouTube videos. Tool, obviously, is here. Uh, and has you can go buy some of the, some of the kind of training tools, the training locks, and you can get that from them. Sather.com is a, just a website that has a bunch of the stuff as well. Oh, I forgot to mention earlier, I'm kind of ADD. So if you have questions, you can interrupt me. I'm okay with that. I don't mind. You don't have to say them all to the end. Um, I reserve the right to ignore you if I don't want to answer it. But um, yeah, so feel free to ask. Uh, office supply warfare. Some things are easier to justify on the productivity and actual benefit to students and some things are harder. This is on the harder end of the spectrum, right? Uh, we were building you know, rubber band shooters, paperclip guns, anything that, that we could to, to destroy things and to, to cause things to be, to, to be shot. Uh, the materials for this are really cheap, right? So you're getting balloons for targets, you're getting um, paperclips, rubber bands, but if you want to do a lot of different designs, if you want to have a lot of different materials and you have a lot of kids, it can, it can actually kind of add up. So you just have to figure out, again, whatever was within your budget. There's two books down there that I'm quite sure no one can read uh, that because of the poor layout choice on my part. Uh, that, that's Mini Weapons of Mass Destruction 1 and Mini Weapons of Mass Destruction 2 because they just couldn't fit it in one, in one book. That is really, really good. Cheat off that. They have great designs. Of course, you've probably got your own, right? Who's taken apart one of those like spring-loaded clicky pens and turned it into a gun? 
Excellent. Those are awesome. That, that's kind of what inspired me. Like one of my favorite, you know, things to make as a kid. And so really this course was an excuse for me to one, practice for my kids that are two and four so that when they get a little bit older, I'm, I'm already ready for the, the kind of things. And two, to, you know, all the things that I as a kid like to do and want to be able to do more of lock picking. I would have loved to do that. I just, I'm, you know, corrupting the youth. That's, that's only slightly tongue in cheek. So um, building this was, was, was a lot of fun. Uh, I gave them the materials, gave them the directions, and then we just went, went crazy, you know, shooting stuff. Making targets. This is, if you really want to engage the kids and get them interested, make targets. My rule was it couldn't be a person who you knew or was a real person. Um, but stick figures, unicorns. Someone made a unicorn target. I'm like, really? Okay. They, they had a unicorn on their balloon. Their goal was to pop the, the unicorn. That was, that was fine. But that makes it a lot more fun to them. So after they make, design the targets and make the guns, then they get to destroy them. Magic tricks. That spectrum of practicality, least useful, but a lot of fun. Again, I like this. I like magic tricks. You know, as a kid, I always wanted to do that. So I did a lot of that. Uh, coin tricks, card tricks, rope. Again, this is a great example of easy giveaway items. I could buy a big spool of rope for 10 bucks, 20 bucks, cut it up into a bunch of pieces, and they've all got rope to do rope tricks now. And they can actually, it wasn't even that expensive. It was like eight bucks, I think, from Walmart or something. Uh, right? So you can get a lot of, uh, a lot of materials. You give them each a quarter and... Uh, they can't even buy a pack of gum with that nowadays, but they can do coin tricks with it, right? So it's still very useful. Um, I did actually get some, some magic card, uh, mag playing cards, excuse me, for some card tricks, because I really like card trips from Amazon, but you can get playing cards really cheap. You can give out something for everybody. So getting something that they can take home is a bribe, and I'm aware of that, and I'm okay with that, right? I just, I wanted them to keep coming back and to have fun and have a good time, so I, I intentionally tried to build as many bribes as possible uh, into it. And I got no complaints from parents, which surprised me, especially after like the, the, the mall uh, pencil shooter that I gave them unsharpened pencils, but it's not hard to sharpen and turn that thing into a pretty ridiculous weapon. I fully expected a complaint from that, but um, they didn't. Uh, so magic tricks, I would love to, to show you how to do the magic tricks, but um, they don't work on adults, I've found. Fifth graders is about the level of my ability to pull off a magic trick and have them still be impressed. And only then about half the time. So they, they, they're like, nah, I've seen that one. I know how you do that trick. And I'm like, uh, be quiet, kid. Um, I, I did get away with a couple of them, but they, they also busted me uh, on a few. So back to a little bit more practical and more interesting and also more requiring of parental notification. Uh, deception and truth, right? So I had to say, this is kind of the, the social engineering, uh, deception, uh, telling, telling the truth, telling lies. Uh, this was, this was interesting. This one surprised me because the kids really actually liked this. They wanted to do this one again. And I think it's mostly because we turned into a game playing. But it started with a, with a, with a, a sort of high-level discussion of, again, ethics and legality and, and not to harp on that. You know, for a hacker, I have a lot of rules, right? It was a little weird. I got I to gotta figure that out. Um, but I, I, wanted to, I talked about uh, a little bit of the psychology of it to, to the level of my understanding, right? Like I didn't get a whole you know, you know, degree in psychology and, and kind of study this stuff, and there's probably better resources on this. But So if you do a lot of penetration testing stuff and have a lot on uh, social engineering, you know, human interaction stuff, neuro-linguistic programming or whatever, that stuff, and you're really interested, help me make a better one of this. I'd love to put it up on the website and have a, have a, better, have a better version. I mostly just talked about lying and, and why, one, you shouldn't do it, and you shouldn't need to do it, because I do actually believe that honesty is the best policy, and you really can uh, go that way. So it was easy for me to tell the kids that, because I believe it or I'm a really good liar. Um, I'm not. Uh, and, and then we played a game, because you have to play games with, with the kids, and that's what, what keeps it fun. Competitions, oh, I didn't even mention this, actually. So the, uh, the, the, the office shooting one, right? I actually made it do a competition, and, and the, the person who had the most accurate weapon or the first person to pop the balloon, or whatever it was, like each week got a little prize, like a candy bar, again, bribes. Or, or whatever it was, something, something simple that you know, kind of incentivized it. it. It's fun, it's games. The reason I, I do capture the flag competitions is because they're awesome and they're fun and they're really good motivation to learn. And when you put like, good incentivization and goals, it just makes, I mean, I'm, you know, I don't need to tell you guys this, you all know this, we all work better when we have that kind of motivation. And so putting, putting uh, some incentive, incentive kind of helps in that. So in, in this case, the game playing was a part of it. We, who's played the game Mafia? Not that many folks. Good, I get to introduce you all to the concept of mafia. Uh, so, real quick, and there's, a, there's about 100 variants. You know how you go to Wikipedia and you're like, oh, I just want to look up this. And then you just, like half an hour later, you're like dazed, like, wow, I know a lot more than I ever intended about children's games. Uh, mafia, it's not even children's games, it's more of a party game. It's an interesting kind of game theoretic approach where there's mafia members and there's townspeople. The, the simplest version of the game. And the mafia, member, the, the mafia is trying to kill everyone in the town 
because that's what the mafia does, right? And the townspeople, I thought they were more parasitic, but this is the, that version of the game. So the, the, the townspeople are trying to clean up their town, clean up their act, get rid, of the, get rid of the mafia members. And so they have a detective, and there's all these variants of a doctor, and if, if you're really going to get all the, 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 the crazy versions, there's all sorts of stuff going on. But the simple thing is, during the nighttime, mafia members look up and then choose to kill a townsperson and then put their heads back down and everyone's you know, quiet and there's a moderator. The townspeople, on the other hand, are trying to kick out the mafia members. The only thing they have to go on, the only, decision that, the only thing that can influence their decision is the questions they ask the mafia members. So you want to talk about like, lying and trying to like, read people? And, I mean, it's, 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 it's a fun game, right? It's a really easy game. It's a fun game. The kids love this. They actually, would multiple weeks after this, would be like, so can we play, my, they actually would forego their dodgeball time. So the, 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 the program that I was, I was a part of had a study group time where they had to go do the homework or read a book or whatever it was. Then they had like the class time with the fun activities. And um, there were other classes besides, besides mine that were being offered. There was a, um, I was really afraid that the beauty class would steal all the girls where they were doing them like a cosmetology, cosmo, the, that word was doing their hair and makeup. And the boys, though, actually loved that one. They would get huge mohawks, and they were going nuts with that. But, um, so there were a lot of other activities, so I was afraid that would influence the numbers. But I had a, a pretty good kind of core of people coming out. Um, and then afterwards, they would do uh, an activity where they could actually let off the steam and run around a bunch. Um, and uh, they would actually forego that for this. They wanted to go play Mafia again. They love playing Mafia. So you can find a game, you can find something that, that they think is exciting, and then they just want to go do that uh, to spread everything else. So Mafia was a fun game. You should you set up a little after-hour session. Everybody can practice out here and have a lot of fun with it. Oh, the, the one thing to be careful of, and if you, if you read the Wikipedia page, it will mention this, Mafia is really hard to tune, right? Like, you have to have, like, this perfect mix of Mafia to townspeople and the right number of people and the right understanding. So you, you have to have the right number of people. Like, if you, I, I forget offhand right now, but if you have, like, eight people, it turns out to be kind of hard to do, but nine's okay, and like it's just, it's just weird, because it can become really easy for Mafia to kill everybody too, too quickly, or there's too few Mafia members, and they can get, the game's just over kind of immediately, so it's, it's an interesting um, setup. So, I had originally told the organizers of this thing that, oh, I'll teach a hacking course, and we'll do some computer stuff, um, and then I did, you know, lock picking and hacking culture, and we made weapons, and I didn't really do any of that stuff, and I felt a little guilty for that. So towards the end of last semester, I taught this as sort of a semesterly thing last semester, and then uh, at, at a, a new semester uh, upcoming, I have a, a bunch of other kind of topics that, that I'm planning on doing as well. But the last class I did was number systems, which is, you know, my, my, I'm building up to the, like, the, okay, let's do some programming, let's do some of, the, some of these kind of more technical things that I promised that I was gonna do. Uh, and, and this I expected would be pretty hard, right? Like, who in this room wants to hear someone talk about number systems, right? Who, who Thank you, Kevin. Kevin wants to hear about number systems. Good, just for you, we'll start with binary. No, I'm, I'm not gonna do that to everyone else. Uh, this is a relatively dry topic. It was a dry topic when they teach it in computer science. It's a dry topic when, so you really have to kind of work hard to make some of this stuff so accessible. Um, oh, I didn't actually fix that. St studying number systems as a precursor to nothing, so. Apparently, I didn't actually have to do this topic. Laptop slide. Uh, this one was just all slides. I used a whiteboard. This was a really good one for lots of whiteboard and exercises. Um, you should be prepared to refresh yourself, depending on how familiar you were with it. And again, if you're not going to do these topics, don't worry about it. If you're not going to do, if this section isn't interesting to you, then, then don't do it. Go with what you know. But if you want to get into computer programming and, and, and you know, logic, I, I think you probably should do this. It's going to be important. Uh, you could do like the, the logo, just turtle programming with you know, directions and basic programming structures. There are some programming environments out for that. But I'd rather teach them something kind of more real. I'd rather teach them something they could use. And the trick for me with number systems was this. Tell them that they can pass notes in class. Tell them their teachers won't be able to decode their messages and they can do it in binary. And now you have their attention, right? So it really is, again, corrupting the youth, right? I was actually getting them to, to, to do this. So, Teach them binary and explain to them, oh, look here. Now, here's the alphabet. Write out your numbers. Pass a message using binary in class. Represent your numbers using zeros and ones. And then you can encode it, do some steganography, dots and dashes, put it into your little you know, drawing in the board, and pass these, pass these notes. So that got, them, that got them excited. They were more interested once they gave them that motivation. This was also all hands-on, too, right? A lot of whiteboard. This was, this was a real brief. Uh, a lot of questions and answers. I had about, about eight kids. And so it was really useful to... Um, 
to, to stop and ask questions and make sure everyone was on the same page. And I was very impressed that the entire room of kids at the end was familiar and comfortable with going back and forth between, between different number systems. Like, so they were doing binary, they were doing hexadecimal. I think, I hope they understood the topics. Now, I fully expect that since it's been a month and a half or two months since the, the, the thing ended and I'm going to start it up again next week, uh, I expect to have to do it again and they're going to have forgotten all of it. But, you know, for a while they actually got it. They, they were doing pretty good. Any questions, by the way? I mentioned I'm ADD, so I like to change topics and stop. No questions? Good. That means I'm a, well, it means it's early in the morning and no one wants to talk. I understand that. <clears throat> All right. So those are lesson plans that uh, you can get on the website, and you can download, uh, you know, the resources for the ones that are already done, although not all lesson plans are, so I have to cheat and finish those up and put them up, but uh, the, the topics I've already presented on. Future topics. Here's the other ones that I want to go to. Um, code, ciphers, and cryptography. I, I mentioned as I started doing number systems, I realized, oh, you, see, this is what they want to do. They want to send secret messages, right? Give them that motivation. And so now I need to go back and I've got to actually teach them simple substitution ciphers and, you know, some, some maybe some polyalphabetic ones, uh, some really crazy Bifid or Visionet or whatever, you know, we'll, we'll have some fun with, with some old school uh, pen and paper crypto systems because uh, they'll like that, right? They, they, as long as you tell them they can keep their mom out of their diary or, or big brother, big sister, whatever, whatever it is. Uh, logic. So actually talking about going from number systems to logic and then I want to go into to, to programming. I have no idea how this is going to work out. So if anyone else has, has done some of uh, these things, please let me know afterwards. I'm looking forward to that. I mentioned I sort of put this off. I was, 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 was lazy and thought I was going to start with this topic and I'm putting off. So I'm saving this sort of um, web fundamentals, security fundamentals, uh, social engineering. Although part of the reason that I actually did them in this order, that we covered the topics we did, was because I actually gave them the choice every week. I had one backup lesson plan. I, I did office weaponry pretty early and then I had uh, leftover supplies and we hadn't done all the designs. So I had that as a backup plan. So one, one little bit of advice is have like one throwaway one so if you're not prepared one week or if something goes poorly, you can, you can do it. But other than that, I let them decide what they wanted to do the next week. I'd say, all right, we have these topics that we can cover. We could do some web security. We could start talking about programming. We could do truth and deception, social engineering. We could, you know, which one topic do you want to do? Let them decide. I didn't care. You know, it was all fun. As long as they were engaged, you know, I was okay with it. So... Um, part of the reason we didn't cover some of the topics we didn't cover was because that was what, what they chose. Um, and then nerf modding. Yeah, that's an important critical skill I think everyone needs to know, so don't, uh, don't underestimate that. Yeah, practically speaking, again, I, it's okay to mix things up. Like after number theory, I, you, you got to throw in some nerf modding, right? Or, well, not number theory, excuse me, number systems. Um, number theory would be fun. If we do real crypto, we could do that. Uh, nerf modding. Something fun, right? It's okay. Not everything has to be exactly practical, especially when you have them for a bigger course, especially when you've got them week to week for a, a semester or, you know, 10 weeks or whatever it is. Like, you can do some things that don't have any great redeeming value. That's all right. Let them have fun. Let them enjoy themselves. It is supposed to be, you know, engaging. It's not supposed to be school. Everything doesn't have to be justified. Or you can come up with some silly excuse that you can tell their parents, like, oh, we're learning fine motor control and, you know, design of, uh, you know, NERF and pneumatic systems. And you, you, can, you can always justify anything if, if you really want to. All right, lessons learned. So this is the part where I tell you about mistakes I made so you don't have to make them. I, I'm actually pretty happy. The, the, the course went pretty well. I think the students had a fun time. They don't run away from me when they see me, you know, walking around town. And so that's, that's a good sign, I feel like. I, it it could have gone worse. Uh, but there still were certainly some things, some things I could have done better or some problems that I feel like I got lucky and, that I, and I avoided. First one is computers are hard. Um, Again, I was supposed to do a computer course and it turned into all these other things. Part of that is because I'm lazy. And good hackers are lazy, right? But I'm lazy because I didn't want to actually have to do a bunch of work setting up computers. It turns out that when I looked at the logistics of getting a dozen computers, installing them with Udi Ubuntu, getting the, the lesson plans set up and the sample exercises and making sure that, yeah, that, that's a lot of work. Instead, I'm gonna go buy some rubber bands and we'll make some guns. Um, that said, I am going to have to, like, I, the problem is I ran out of all the, the easy ones, and now the next semester I'm moving into, I'm, we're, we're going to be getting into the programming, so I'm going to have to continue to do that. The good news is, again, there are a lot of resources out there. You can put EDU Ubuntu. There's some kid-friendly you know, friendly programming uh, environments that you, you can use. So the resources are out there that, that kind of help it. Or, again, get friends. Get other people to kind of help you with it. Get somebody else that... Um, that, that can do it. I did actually mention um, hackerspaces earlier as one of the, the ways to get involved in organizationally things to do. That's a great way to do it too because, uh, for example, a local um, high school in my area is doing the first robotics competition, 
which uh, I don't know if you're familiar with a lot of high schools. It's a great, you know, a great thing for, to, to get students interested in programming and mechanical engineering and electrical engineering, and, and also they get to build robots, so who wouldn't love to do that? And I had a, a number of friends that were interested, but they're all like, I don't have enough time. I couldn't mentor this team because a, a, a friend came to me and said, my son's doing this. You're a geek. You know geeks. Do any of them want to help, you know, kind of mentor a team? And I thought, I know a ton of guys that love to do this. And when I have to ask them, they're all like, I don't have any time. I said, no, I understand that. But four of you said you had a little bit of time. What if you each do like a rotation schedule, right? So if you've got a hacker space, if you've got a local 2600 group, if you've got a local um, you know, city sec meetup, whatever it is, band together with other people and then timeshare. If you each do one lesson and there's four of you, that's once a month you have to, you know, for, at a weekly thing, right? You, you, you can make it much more manageable. And so then you get all four of the people to come and help, you know, configure all your computers, get everything set up and, and make life a lot easier. So hands-on is a must. I've already talked about game playing, exercises, making goals. Oh, I didn't talk about my, my bribe that was mean. Uh, I told students during the lock picking, well, we told students during the lock picking that we would give them, was, it was 100 grand, right? Was that what that's, I had, I, I told them I'd give them 100 grand if they could pick this one particularly hard lock. And yeah, you got the joke already, don't you? Uh, someone picked the lock and it was a really hard lock and we were impressed. Uh, so we gave them the candy bar, 100 grand. And they took it, they were not too disappointed, I think. They, they probably didn't really expect to get 100 grand, but um, Again, incentivization, making it fun, making them have good reasons for doing it, making them excited about it, uh, and hands-on. The, the more you can do that, the better, uh, because they're going to be... Th this is an after-school program th that I was involved with. So by definition, it occurs after... Cool. Really? <laughs> I know it's early. I'm sorry. It's, I... Let's try it again. After... Thank you. So it occurs after school. So what have they done in school all day? Sat in a chair. Um, you don't want to do that. Who would want to make somebody sit in a chair for an hour and just listen? <laughs> Oops, I'm sorry. <laughs> do what I say, not what I do. Um, so there's, they've got tons of pent-up energy, right? They're really like fidgety. And like that one kid, Jay, that was off camera, he was nuts. He was just like going every week. He was, he was so hard to contain. So you, you kind of have to take that into account. So you want to do hands-on, but it's also crazy because they've got all this energy and they're going to be, you know, breaking things in, in every, every ways that, that you couldn't do it. Um, so that brings me to the, the sad slide. Um, you kind of have to have some discipline if you want to actually, you know, run a class like this. It, it's a hacker thing, right? I don't want to have discipline. Rules, man, those aren't for me. Uh, the, the trick is for me it, it was a couple of things. One, I set rules, but I would explain the rules, unlike the why, Right? Because, again, that critical thinking, the thing that I'm really trying to encourage them to do is question things and ask why and understand things. And that's okay. There are rules that are there for good reasons. But don't just tell me a rule and expect me to follow it just because it's a rule. I want to know why. That's kind of our mindset. That's why we break things. That's why we make things better. That's why we look underneath the, the underpinnings of things. So I was okay with them questioning me. Um, but, and then I had to justify things. And some of that was pretty easy. Why do I want you to not point that rubber band shooter at someone? Because you'll put an eye out. More importantly, because legally I'm responsible for you right now and I don't want to have a lawsuit, right? Like there's really good reasons. So that's why I had some of these rules. And so I explained those exact rules to the students and I'm completely fine if they know that I'm more concerned about a lawsuit than their eye. That's not true. I was concerned about their eyes too. Uh, so I, I would explain the rules. I set the rules, but then I would explain the rules. And then I would carry out discipline. And so I'm a, a parent now. And so if you're a parent, this, this will not be new to you. If you're not, maybe this will be surprising. But kids will tend to obey if you set boundaries, you're clear on the boundaries, they're reasonable boundaries, and then you enforce it when they violate those boundaries. Like, it's a simple formula. It doesn't always work. You can look at my kids. I don't, my kids aren't old enough yet uh, to, to really, but for now it's mostly working. So I had to kick a kid out of the class. So this, this kid that was, that was too energetic, I actually had to ask him to leave the class a couple times, or he would have to sit out in certain activities. He would do something. I said, if you point a rubber band shooter, a BB gun shooter at someone else in this class, you're done with this exercise. And I meant it because I didn't want a lawsuit, right? So I had to enforce that. And no one else pointed a weapon at somebody else. And it's funny how they will actually remember when you make the consequences like that. So if you have another way of doing this, if you can productively run a class so they can have fun and do these things and get stuff done without discipline, let me know. Because I would love to not have any rules. But I haven't figured out a way yet. So you really have to kind of balance that. that. Uh, related to that, 
when I kicked the kid out of the class, I didn't just like make him go in the hallway. I actually had the, there was a proctor, so the the, the group that was do, that was doing it with had two people in every class, which is really nice. So even for like eight kids, there were there were two of us, and somebody they were just sort of like the, the the room mom, you know, whatever. They would just kind of sit sit there to the side, and they would help with exercises. The room mom was I think Jay was actually going to point this out was the one that picks the was it the six pin with safety pins or was it five. It was, a, it was a, a difficult lock to pick that you and a couple other people had not at the time picked, I believe. No, no, but, but that, that, that next morning, like, like after that, oh, I picked it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. When that soccer mom picked that lock, and you're like, I can't pick this lock. I haven't picked it yet. Like, <clears throat> remember I said motivation and incentivization? Yeah. He had motivation to, to pick that lock, right? So I think she was the first one to win the 100 grand, yeah. We're like, she said it, we didn't. Yeah, well, so, and that, that actually is one of, the, yeah, one of the points for the lock picking really is, again, why would you break, pick a lock? It's far, if you want to break into place, there's far more effective ways of doing it. You know, lock picking is fun, it's exciting, you learn how things work, and, you know, it can be practical, and you can actually get into things you get into. Yeah? Did, did anybody tell you part of this to have two adults? Um, to always be like two people and do the scouts and each. So, uh, I, yes, because... Um, Yes, yes, absolutely, thank you. The question was, did anyone tell me beforehand to always have two adults in the room? So I have had some prior experience, and I'm aware that this, why that's a good idea. Thank you for bringing that up and reminding me. Um, there is a, uh, a later slide talking about legal responsibility, and one of the legal responsibilities in Florida is you have to have a background check. And as a part of that, the church that I was working with, um, they would do a background check, and then also I had to have one person who was with the kids had to have a special training class that they put on that explained what you can and cannot do. Don't touch naughty parts. I mean, you know, right? But 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 seriously, you, you need you need to always have two people around. You know, where at all possible. Of course, practically speaking, sometimes stuff will happen, but two people in the room, two people in in sight, doors open, that kind of stuff. You know what? The world we live in, it's just better to be safer. And so, so to protect yourself from a legal liability perspective as well as just if there's an emergency and a kid gas, you know, puts his eye out, one of you is going to have to go run him to the, the ER. And if you've got eight kids, you're not going to throw them all into the back of your, your minivan um, or mini because they wouldn't fit in that. Um, right? So, so just practically speaking, yeah, absolutely. As many, you know, if you can get a couple of other adults to help, whether they're the parents or other people. Is that anything else, sir? Thank you. Yes, thank you for reminding me because that's and, and and Cub Scouts again. That's that's absolutely a, a great example. There's there's a lot of you know Boy Scouts. There's a lot of organizations that have this down pat, and so the get help section. If you have a friend who has a lot of kids, is a professional teacher, or otherwise engages youth a lot, and you don't talk to them beforehand, okay? Because kids are funny. Like you can program children, and uh, they can abuse the heck out of you. Uh, my daughter has a, a loophole in her logic that I don't know how I installed this back door in her, but when, when I tell her, what if I said no? Like, what if I said no to you? What would your response be? And because she knows the game is, uh, I'm going to pay attention. And if you say the wrong response, like if you don't choose the right choice, oh, well, you're definitely not going to get whatever it is you're asking for then. And so, oh, I'd be okay if you say no. I'd be okay if you say no. And, like, every time. And then I can follow through. I can say, okay, then no. And she has a great attitude. It's just just bizarre loophole. Or the it's the other example is it's not um, okay. You ready? Are you ready to go take your bath? It's what color are the bubbles going to be tonight? Right? Like you assume the thing. And this is this probably works with adults too, um, but it works most effectively with children. So uh, if you if you haven't had a lot of experience with kids, if you're nervous about that, just get somebody who does. Get a friend who um, you know is is an elementary school teacher. Somebody to help you get them to kind of train with you, practice. Um, they're they're a little bit different, but it, but it's it's well worth doing. Prepare. So I mentioned uh, my, my uh, office weaponry one. I had built beforehand all the office supply ones. And so I knew, for example, because I had done this beforehand, one of the, one of the, the instructions I had printed out required you to take an X-Acto knife, shave out a small sliver of a clothespin to adjust the gap and to make it so that you could, you could shoot the things with. Uh, 
Not a problem, except I'm not giving fifth graders X-Acto knives and asking them to shave off a piece of a wooden clothespin. So I knew this in advance. I had two X-Acto knives, one for myself and one for the, the room mom, and we were the ones that cut this, right? But if, 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 if you don't prepare, you're going to get into trouble. The, the other problem was for the office uh, warfare one, I didn't actually test all of the the supplies. I did like four out of the five plans that I had brought and supplies I had brought for. The fifth one was a disaster. It didn't work. And I didn't know this because I hadn't actually practiced. I found out the mechanical pencils I bought were the wrong kind before I the other ones. Like, do a dry run through, right? You, you, you will save yourself a lot of embarrassment. And, you know, you think that, whatever, it's a room of kids. Like, I was just as embarrassed if I screwed up in front of those kids as I am in front of this room because, I mean, kids have no shame, so they'll call you out on them more. If I were to screw up here, for the most, most of the, this audience, some of these guys here, not so much, most of the audience would be polite, you would be forgiving, and you would let me get away with something if I screwed up a slide. Those kids, they have no filters. They will not. So it's a little nerve-wracking. So the more you prepare, uh, the better off you are. Attendance fluctuates. This is a real practical, oh yeah, question. Was it useful from a teaching perspective to have something that failed? You know, I, I, I didn't think about it that way, but I probably should have um, to, to intentionally build failure in because, yeah, routing around failure is also a, a good value, a you know, good critical thinking skill. Uh, that's a good point. That's not something that I intentionally built in. I should have. I should have pretended. Yeah, no, I know. <clears throat> I uh, had failures built into each lesson so that when I made a mistake, they could learn a valuable lesson about how not to do things. Thank you for reminding me of that brilliant um, <clears throat> move I made. Uh, no. So attendance fluctuates. Practically speaking, they're not required to be in your class probably, right? If you're doing this, this is an after school program, if you're doing a, a, you know, a scout thing, this is something that they're doing because they like it. So it's a pretty high bar, right? They have to kind of to kind of want to be there, to, to be there every week. And, there, and there's a lot of other concerns there. The, the parents may not be able to ride them, drive them that week. So you're going to get different levels of attendance. Just be, be prepared in advance. Most of the previous topics I did, that was less of a concern. But having seen the attendance vary, I now know going into the computer ones where lessons are much more building on the previous ones, you, you're going to have to, I'm going to have to figure out some way around that. I don't know a great answer. So if you have ideas, let me know what you think because it's going to be hard when you haven't been there for number systems and you haven't been there for uh, you know, logic and I'm expecting you to do some of the programming stuff. Um, so just kind of have to figure out how to, how to take that into account. Legal issues. So I already kind of skipped ahead a little bit to this uh, or mentioned it previously. Depending on the state you are in, there may be certain requirements on child care, background check, classes, whatnot. Just, just be aware that this is something that, that you should look into. You probably won't have to worry, this, worry about this because I assume most people would want to and should be working with an organization that knows how to do that stuff, right? You're the technical brains, you provide the hacking, you provide the program, whatever it is that, that you're gonna go teach the kids that you're bringing, partner with an organization that gives you the logistics that may even help have other people to help with the room mom, they'll help you deal with unruly children or they'll have, you know, they'll have all these kind of stuff figured out. Um, freaked out parents. Well, not technically a legal issue, the lawsuit that, that comes afterwards is potentially. So this was, was a, a bigger concern for me. Um, no one can read that, I'm quite sure of it. Uh, but this was my permission slip. I, I, I refused to teach any kid lock picking unless I had one of these signed by their parents back to me. Now, the good news was I had a little bit of a, a loophole and a little bit of leeway because the room mom that was with me would actually, uh, it, there was always one or two kids that maybe it was the first week there and they didn't know or their parents, the, the people at the front desk reg registering them didn't know to get the parent to read the form and sign it. So the room mom would call them up, she would explain, she would read through it all and then just verbally get permission from them and write it down. And so that to me was good enough. Again, this is one of the things on the website. So if you want to crib my notes and steal it or you can make up your own. But, but the point was I wanted to engage the parents. I wanted them to actually be actively involved in the conversation. Remember, I'm not just hacking the kids. I'm hacking the parents too. I'm trying to change a, you know, a cultural understanding of what hacking is. And so as a part of that, the more the parents talk to the kids about what we're learning, the better, right? So I really wanted to, to, to kind of scare them a little bit with this, make them actually have to talk to the kids or talk to me. No parent emailed me or called me. I mean, I put my phone number in my you know, email, and, which was a little bit of a bummer. I could have, would have liked to have actually engaged with some of the parents. Although it was good to see, again, one of the room moms was uh, the mom of a kid in the class. And so to have her there, I knew at least one mom was really actively involved and was going to, although that was the mom of the, the kid that was crazy. Um, maybe that was why. Yeah, Kevin. Yeah, so I mean the full thing talks about I'm teaching kids to, you know, 
pick locks and hacking and I don't remember if I specifically mentioned deception. I said, or, you know, and other similar things like, yeah, and no parent called me. No parent emailed me. And there were at least a dozen of these that I got back signed. Do you know if you had any parents who read it and said no? Do I know if there were any parents that read it and said no? Every child that I gave a slip to, I got back a signed slip to, from. The, every child that, that, that came back to the thing at all. Because there were other classes and activities. So they could come back and they could, again, they could go get their hair done up and by the, the other class. Or they could do Legos. Or there was a, oh, the science one was cool. They had a science teacher who was, you know, fire every week because who doesn't want to make fire like, you know, they made the, like, the fire in your hand. And so uh, there were other things they could do so that the kids could come back and not do my class. They, could, they had other options. And I don't know of anybody who came back but didn't participate because of a permission slip. There were ones that would choose to do those things on a week-to-week basis, depending. Although most of them did. I had a real following. It was kind of cool. I mean, there were, like, the kids that were really disappointed when I was on travel that week and, and couldn't be there, which was, which was kind of fun. Um, but that, that was a good question. Yeah, so parents were surprisingly non-concerned. Um, <laughs> But I guess that's part of the problem, right? And that's 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 part of the goal is to yes. Are you sure the parents actually read the permission slips? Because I know a lot of kids whose parents get like their teeth written for the day and just sign them. Am I sure the parents read the permission slips? That's a great question. I have no idea. Um, maybe next time I require that the parents email me back. I email them and they email me back. I understand that, comma. <laughs> My children will be corrupted. They will come home, you know, hacking computers and picking locks, and you are, to, you are not to blame. Uh, that, that's a great question. Um, I, 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 that seems very likely that parents didn't read it at all. Um, that's, that, that's a good explanation. Anybody else? So, recap. Corrupting teaching is fun. That's what you get when you finish slides at 2 a.m. <clears throat> Corrupting children is fun. You should do it. Also, no punctuation in that sentence. Find fun topics. Find what you care about, right? I'm giving out all the slides and ideas and references and links, and there's a lot of great stuff that's out there. Everything is on the internet, right? You can, any topic you want to teach on, you can find resources find on, but find the ones that you care about. Find the ones that you like. Um, avoid common pitfalls, uh, permissions, list planning, whatever. There's some links. This whole thing is Creative Commons, the website, all that stuff. Any other questions? Yes? So, so the question is, nobody wants to learn about ethics and history, right? Agreed. Uh, so how do, you, how do you engage them? How do you make it more exciting? So for me, that was the first talk, so it was kind of new to them. I was new to them. They weren't as familiar with me. So part of that was them just kind of getting used to it. So I think I had a, a little bit of break before they were like impatient because they wanted to get to the fun stuff and they knew what was coming. So I think if I would have done that, the third one, after we had been picking locks, and st- would not have gone over so well. They'd be like, give me the good stuff. Uh, but So I did that first. The other thing was I asked a lot of questions, and I made them, re- like, explain to me examples of, so what is ethics? So we actually, I think we talked about, like, a, a civics, and, like, I went to, like, a government lesson. We, I, I told you I have ADD. We started talking about, like, the three branches of government, and because we were talking about state laws versus national law, federal laws, and the differences between the two, and how, you know, if you break certain laws, there are different kind of, kind of reactions. So we, we kind of got far afield, and that's not in my slides at all, if you go and look at all the slides that I have from that week, but whatever, we had time, and, you know, we talked about it. Uh, the, any question they asked, I would go and talk about. It was remotely on topic because they had asked and they cared about it. So as, as much as possible, I asked them, give me an example of something that's maybe unethical but not illegal. Or give me an example of something that, aside from the fact that many would consider it ethical to follow the laws, give me an example of a law that maybe not, is not really an ethical concern. Like it's not really unethical to, to jaywalk, right? It's more of a practical concern in an organizational, it's not an, an ethics issue. So made them give me examples of each of those and try to come up with those. And I was surprised and impressed. They, they got it or, or are good at faking it because they, they, had, they had good answers. And then throughout the other ones, when I, would, I would ask someone to review especially when there were new kids that had been to the first one. So on lockpicking especially or deception, I would want to review those topics and they, they would pair it back to me, the, the right answer. So they appeared to get it. Um, and history. History is fun because, I'm up time. History is fun because it's hacking. So I think history of hacking is fun. And I talked about things that I liked about and cared about. So again, talk to what you know. And that's it. Thank you. Sorry. Sorry, man. No, no, that's good. I have some announcements. So some quick announcements.